Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, Louis Sage Passant on private sector intelligence. There is no guidebook on how to do this. In my interviews, I found that only 3.5% of practitioners would cite uh, industry standards as having anything to do with the ethics of their job. A lot of companies start along this path with good intentions. They say, I just want to keep my colleagues safe. I want to keep our company safe. And then that definition of safe starts to creep over time. And it becomes, you know, yes, we need to know where the terrorists are. So we'll focus on that. Well, now we need to know where the environmental activists are. Now we need to know who the environmental activists are. And, oh, we might start thinking about who the critics of the company are. And that's where it starts to get really problematic. Lewis, welcome to Chatter. Thanks very much for having me, David. Oh, thank you for coming on. We have a, a different kind of conversation that we're hosting today, which is on the intersection between the private sector and intelligence. And that, that's an interesting intersection, isn't it? Because when most people think of intelligence, it's it's almost immediate that you think, if you think at all, that, that it's a governmental function, that it's something that is for nation states and maybe back further in history, you could go to city states and other entities, but definitely governmental. And we're going to try to draw some contrasts there and, and dig into the history. How did you first become interested in the topic of private sector intelligence? That's a good question. Uh, so I, I started out after I left the army, uh, moving into a private sector intelligence role. And then after um, just over a decade of working in the field, I, I decided I'd, I'd like to do a PhD. That was my kind of COVID stuck at home uh, hobby moment of, of realizing this this might be a, a nice project to work on. And I approached my university and I said, you know, I'd like to look at um, intelligence in the private sector and compare it to government intelligence and to see who's doing it best and see if there's any any lessons we can draw from this. And my university's response was to really look at me like I was crazy and go, well, what do you mean, private sector intelligence? Are you, are you talking about government contractors like Booz Allen Hamilton? And I realized that I'd probably gotten a little ahead of myself and I had to actually really explain what private sector intelligence even was. And, and that's really what my, my PhD is set out to do, is to look at this field and explain what the kind of similarities and difference between public and private are. And as you touched on, look at the history of this and then some of the areas where it's, it's gone right or wrong in history. Well, be before we go to the history, I, I want to dig down on what you just said, because for the few people who hear the word intelligence and don't immediately go to, you know, government officers, right? people hired by a government to to do work, be it analysis or operations or covert action on behalf of the government. The people that do think beyond that probably do go to the Booz Allen Hamiltons, as you call them, that is the contractors that work for those governmental intelligence agencies. That That is a big business, right? Absolutely. And I, I th certainly think it's an important one, but it's really led to a bit of an overlooking of what my thesis is looking at, which is the private sector in the sense of the corporations, the, the Disneys, the Facebooks, the, the, the mm. private companies that we all know and uh, love or dislove, dislike. Uh, <laughs> but really looking at uh, looking at how they protect themselves through using intelligence. And what I've noticed is that in the academic space, at least, there's almost a, a, an overlooking of those actors because there's such a focus, such a hijacking almost of the term by these government contractors. So to differentiate, I, I've really taken a view of, of using the audience receiving the intelligence as, as mm -hmm. what really defines the intelligence. So the way I look at it is, if someone is doing intelligence for the government, regardless of whether they're a green badge holder or a, a government employee, at the end of the day, what they're doing is creating intelligence, uh, creating government intelligence, and therefore they're mm -hmm. doing government intelligence. And then the opposite of that, if someone's doing private intelligence, it means that ultimate audience is, is in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck by this. We, we often talk about issues of fiction and, and pop culture here. And I can think of a whole lot of movies and TV shows and novels about government intelligence. And I can actually think about some that are what you just described, that are private sector companies that are hired, 
the the new movie the contractor i believe is one of these where you have people who are private sector entities but are doing governmental or quasi governmental functions uh, they're of course the wide subgenre of the government agents gone rogue <laughs> issue i'm having a hard time thinking of a purely private sector intelligence movie or TV show. That is, you know, somebody saying Target, the retailer in the United States or, you know, um, Tesco, right? That somebody has <laughs> an intelligence wing and they're going to make a show about that. Are you aware of any pop cultural representations? And if not, is that why perhaps it is lesser understood? Um, I'm not aware of any. That's a great question, by the way. I'm, I'm not aware of any film or TV representations. I I come across the topic occasionally in the kind of science fiction world as this dystopian cyberpunk corporate future, uh, really a, a sign of things gone wrong. The corporation has gotten too powerful, and I always find that quite striking because, as far as I'm aware, that's actually where we're at right now. In that the the field of private sector intelligence does exist. Um, but no, I'm not aware of any films or TV shows where this exists. And it's a real shame because in diving into the history, I found some some really tremendous examples that I actually think would probably make some some quite good stories out there. Well, if any uh, studios are listening, we may have some ideas here. But you, you make a good point, which is science fiction, uh, some of which is is more scientific than others. Some of it is just futurist work. And there is some science fiction I can think of where now, you know, there are companies in the future and they're doing things that are kind of like intelligence <laughs> well, uh, as they're out there operating either against competitors uh, or uh, against aliens. And it would kind of qualify as intelligence work. So maybe by, by looking forward, we can get a, a better window on, on our present. Um, but let's also look backward to do so because we can trace back the origins of governments to ancient empires if we want. And there's the you know, oft-cited passage in the Bible that points to spying very early on in civilized history. But there's not as much pointing to private industry in those ancient texts. So how far back do we have to go to get to what you would call a legitimate private sector or someone operating for personal gains rather than for societal or government gains and then building intelligence into that picture? So it's an interesting question because I think you have to really divide it out into two things. So I think there are elements of non-government intelligence that go a very, very long way back beyond the, the rise of the Westphalian state. But then to, to the second part of your question, when it was being done for private entities or for private consumption or truly private consumption, I think that comes a little bit later on. And the reason I say that is, and looking back through the history, what I first found is that there's a there's a kind of braid of history. It's not neatly private sector intelligence over here and neatly public sector intelligence over there. The, the two are kind of interlinked throughout their history. They cooperate. They co-opt one another. Uh, private business is often operating as a cover for government intelligence. Governments are often supporting private entities. And as a result, it's very difficult to, to neatly pass the two out. But it does happen at some point during the history. So to give you an example, um, you know, 14th century Venice was very heavily involved in um, intelligence in all aspects of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the merchants, um, the merchants guilds of Venice were very heavily imbued with the sense that they had to go out and collect intelligence, both as part of their kind of national duty, if they saw an Ottoman fleet while they were off sailing, they had to turn around and come back and report it right. so that the much smaller and, and much more lightly armed Venice could defend itself. But then those same merchants also understood the value of intelligence. And, um, you know, they created one of the first newspapers, um, the, the uh, Nova Gazetta de Venice, I believe it's called, mm -hmm. um, which was essentially a report on geopolitical affairs for merchants to keep them informed of what was going on around the world and how it might impact their business. But it's still not really such a neat example because it's still part of the, the city. And if you read uh, Joanna Jordanu's work, uh, Venice's Secret Service, she talks a lot about um, the idea that Venice is is really a corporation that happens to have a city. So, so passing out the two is quite difficult. 
One of probably the earliest and strongest examples is um, a rival of Venice, which is a guy called uh, Jacob Fugger, who's a, a German industrialist. You know, I've, uh, heard, cro- I've heard that name, and I want to say, I'll make a fool of myself here if I'm wrong, but wasn't he in competition with um, with the head of the Malian Empire as the richest man who ever lived because of what, what he was able to amass? That's exactly right. Um, so at the time of his death, he had something like four percent of Europe's GDP in his in his personal uh, his wow. personal treasury. So an incredibly wealthy individual. Um, my pet theory is that Littlefinger from Game of Thrones was based on him. He he was a highly wealthy industrialist who pulled a lot of political strings throughout kind of fourteenth century uh, uh, the Holy Roman Empire and, uh, and across the borders of Europe. Um, by deploying his wealth, deploying his network of spies and couriers who could get news to him before it broke for anyone else. Um, and he he essentially ran his empire off the back of this intelligence network by finding out the results of various battles before anyone else. He could, he could influence the way states would react to them. He could influence the way his wealth was deployed to to leverage those results. And, now, and Lewis, that doesn't, that doesn't sound wealth. quite like a modern corporation, but that does sound like what I would call a, a private sector effort, right? Absolutely. So I think he's one of those first examples you'd see. But at the same time, he's operating in very fragmented 14th century, what is now Germany, where the idea of the state is still not a fully formed concept, that a, a wealthy individual is really a government into themselves at that point. So he's probably one of those early examples, I would say, you know, is it is a hint that this is there. And then as you progress through the history, you start finding kind of similar examples, wealthy individuals. There's the famous, uh, what appears to be a, a bit of a myth based on the Baron Rothschild and his um, generating wealth off of the back of the Battle of Waterloo. Through similar means to Fuga, he um, supposedly had a spy network and a courier network across Europe that raced to London to deliver him the, the news of, of Wellington's victory uh, at a time when everyone thought that, that the British had actually been defeated. Now, the Rothschild Foundation actually claims that this uh, story was built on the back of an anti-Semitic pamphlet uh, distributed about four decades later in France Hmm. as a kind of smear against the Rothschilds. But very interestingly, they essentially say, no, no, he did have an intelligence network. He did have a courier network, but simply the news of Waterloo got him too late for it to be any use. So he didn't make money by playing the markets that way. Um, but they don't deny that he he was running an intelligence network. So you see these wealthy individuals doing this kind of thing um, throughout that period. And then when you get to the really kind of corporate sense, as we would understand, I think the, the first example I've come across is probably Lloyd's of London, the insurance firm in, oh, sure. in London. Sure. So they, um, you know, at one point they had a, an enormous part of, of both the UK and global GDP on their books underwritten. So in order to manage that risk, they had to really quantify that risk. And to quantify that risk, they used intelligence. And there's some fantastic, very flowery language around this that, that um, Lloyd's today still uses in some of their pamphlets where they said, you know, not a not a breeze could blow anywhere in the world without us knowing about it, without us having it on, on our books, um, which I think is a really fantastic description. And they, you know, they manage this vast information gathering network across all of the ports of the world, or at least the 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 world as it was traded in in those days and um eventually got to the point where they had such a vast intelligence machinery they had to create the bureaucracy to support that and they created what's known as the lloyd's agency to to help manage all these agents and what i find particularly interesting in this example is um throughout most of the kind of 1800s they were regularly informing the british admiralty about uh, Royal Navy vessels being sunk, about French raids off the coast of the UK, things that the Admiralty probably should know about were coming from Lloyd's of London. Um, The Prime Minister was regularly getting briefed by Lloyd's on battles happening half a world away. Now, one can forgive this. The the Admiralty at the time was about 60 people strong, so a very small organisation. Intelligence probably didn't command much of a a kind of... uh, a budget or uh, importance in those days, whereas Lloyd's was such a huge organization. So naturally, they were able to pull in so much more. But it's quite an interesting example, because it, it's one of those early examples of where the private sector is outstripping the public sector and conducting mm-hmm. intelligence. So as you can see, quite a quite a long history that's that's not always neatly delineated between private and public, but there's a lot right. of interaction between the two. On the Lloyd's example, it 
it seems to me that of any organization that is many hundreds of years old, uh, a company like Lloyd's would be the best for researchers because they're inherently into the keeping records thing, right? So <laughs> there are probably better historical accounts from Lloyd's of London for things that happened many hundreds of years ago than for virtually any other entity in society. Um, is that why we know about their efforts, simply because the records are available and similar efforts may have been lost from those who went before? That's a question I, I absolutely love. And unfortunately, it's not really that neat. So what I found is that where there are records, it's, it's more of a fluke than anything, because the, the private sector, unlike researching intelligence in the public sector, it doesn't have a declassification date. Mm. So you don't have a, a set amount of time in which those records become available. So a lot of companies, they simply never release these records if they even exist. Um, Lloyd's in particular, they do have some records um, in City Hall in London that I've actually really struggled to get access to because every time I've approached Lloyd's, they've kind of said, well, we have this official history and there's a lot out there in various history books about this, but they're not really sure about this Lloyd's agency. They're not really sure what they can tell me about the operations they've done in the intelligence world. And I found that in a lot of companies when I've approached them and asked for access to records, everything from, we don't know what you're talking about, and uh, this genuine kind of surprise that they, they even have an intelligence agency and they've got no idea who I can talk to about this through to, you know, yes, we know what you're talking about, but I'm afraid we can't give you access to those records. Uh, and unlike government records, I, I have no right to be able to see them in a lot of cases. So where I do find those archives and those records, it tends to be a combination of things. Sometimes it's a fluke. Sometimes it's someone's private records or corporate records that have been donated to a university somewhere. Mm -hmm. More often than not, it's where there's been a scandal, um, where something's gone wrong, and this has been released through the media, through investigations. And as a result, we, we get a glimpse into that history of private sector intelligence. And I think, to come back to your earlier question about why there's no kind of pop culture representation of this, why why there's such a lack of awareness of the history. I think it's in part that. I think that unlike government intelligence, it, it doesn't get released on a scheduled basis. Um, and therefore, we're much less aware this stuff's going on. And then the other side of it is that governments like everyone to know when they've conducted an intelligence operation successfully, um, at least something that, that, you know, much later on can be held up as a win. In the private sector, there's always a degree of discomfort with the very existence of an intelligence agency or an intelligence operation within a company. So companies, even when they've got it right, they tend to keep that very close to their chest. They tend to keep it very quiet. Hmm. You know, it makes me think this is a good reality check for researchers and journalists who are struggling to find out what happened inside UK intelligence or US intelligence during, let's say, the last administration, so a few years ago, when here you are talking to Lloyds of London saying, hi, you you had this operation going 200 years ago, and I'd like to see some of the records, and, and they hold that to be <laughs> too recent to let you see. What about some of the other, and I have to ad admit my ignorance here of uh, British quasi-governmental corporations, so I don't know the range here. But what comes to mind as soon as you start talking about Lloyd's of London and about the British Empire, I immediately think of things like the East India Company um, and its operations. And then in a, I think a slightly different guise, the Hudson's Bay Company, these, these entities that at least in my schooling, I learned were not purely governmental, even though they were often employed for government purposes and were uh, going along parallel tracks. Uh, often with foreign office efforts, um, but definitely with a, a private money-making side to them. And yet, I, I can't imagine that they would not have had functions that we could loosely call intelligence collection and analysis for their decision makers. Do you have any insight on on those companies and where they fall in this area? So I think the British East India Company is a very good example. And I think they look a lot like Venice in many ways. And, and that's really why I tend not to call them out as one of the earliest examples. Um, up until the, the 1773 Regulating Act, they, they really were a, a private company. They were operating very independently and they absolutely did have intelligence uh, operations. I found references from the, the 1690s of a uh, 
uh, quite an angry letter to an outpost on the Persian border, basically telling the the kind of governor of this outpost, hey, why aren't you collecting intelligence for us? We need to know everything that's going on in the area. You're leaving us vulnerable here. Um, so they absolutely were engaged in this kind of stuff. They were dealing with, um, you know, the Marathas, the Afghan tribes, Indian Ocean pi- uh, privateers. Uh, so they they absolutely had to have this extensive intelligence and in some ways kind of crisis management and uh, you could call it a security department really it was a private army mm-hmm. and then after the the regulating act they they got pulled into the fold of of the British Empire and that still continued but it, it comes back to my earlier comments about this being a lot more part of gathering government intelligence and using the company as just a convenient mechanism for that mm-hmm. so it seems that the, the study of this, at least going back to that era, really is a function of Renaissance Europe becoming modern Europe and, and the, the rise of what we call a private sector, as opposed to many other world cultures, which you know did not have the same development as uh, the Italians and then across Europe. So I'm assuming from your comments that there is no prominent example of a purely private sector intelligence operation operating out of, let's say, China or out of Japan at its height? No, that's a that's a great question, at least not that I've come across. And that's that's probably a future research project, me uh, trying mm-hmm. to fill in those gaps in the map where I haven't really had much insight to. The uh, non-Anglosphere examples I found tend to be those much less neat examples. So um, mm. across the the kind of Mesoamerican cultures, there were examples of merchant spy guilds, but they were still very much oh. using mercantile activities as a cover for spying for the state. And then uh, India, the Athra Shastra, uh, the kind of Indian Machiavellis, uh, you know, guide guide to. Uh, uh, governance that talks a lot about economic espionage by using merchants and traders, but again, it's still very much for the government. So it's a, a very, it's a very messier example. Whereas in in at least the Anglosphere world, I find these much, or at least the European world, these much kind of neater examples of of where you can pass out public and private at least slightly. Mm-hmm. In the United States, the development of the private sector and its intersection with the government. The, the prominent case that often comes up in intelligence studies is the Pinkerton Detective Agency. I believe it was called at one point, but the Pinkerton Organization. Can you give us a little bit of background on Pinkerton and the organization and how it, how it played into these dynamics of being a private entity, but working on what eventually came to be seen as uh, intelligence functions? So Pinkerton's a fascinating example. So Alan Pinkerton, the, the founder of, of the company, he's a, a migrant to the United States from Scotland who, who fled Scotland because his uh, clamor for labor reform in the Charteris movement found him at the kind of a, a oppressed end of interactions with the police. So he moved to the US in search of a, a kind of freer life. And at, at the start of his kind of private detective journey, he, he started engaging in things that we in the corporate sector today would call insider risk activities, you know, riding railways and looking for mm. uh, railway attendants, stealing fares and mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. that. And then eventually he he was hired by some coal and uh, coal and rail interests um, across the US to help with starting to look into organized labor movements and also secret societies, the Molly Maguires and groups like that, who were um, causing trouble for some of these kind of wealthy industrialists. And this is where I I find him so interesting that someone from a charterist background can uh, pivot on on his earlier ideals and become, you know, find himself on the other side of that kind of interaction. Um, And to me, that says that it was probably quite a lucrative line of business. Now, it's always hard to really know the truth with Pinkerton because as well as being a very successful detective agency, they were also a very uh, successful publicist. They published a lot of novels, comic books, novellas. Uh, kind There's of a reason why out. we think of them, right? <laughs> Exactly, and yeah. uh, you know they spend a lot of money on kind of charting out the uh, charting out the exploits of their daring uh, detectives and things like that, which, in a lot of ways, I think probably created this mythos around them. But it does look like they were very successful. They had a number of very high profile clients, a number of quite highly successful cases of infiltrating undercover agents into labor activist groups and things like that. Um, 
Now, Pinkerton's interesting because he took a, a brief break from private sector work during the Civil War, uh, where he worked uh, assisting uh, General George McClellan in kind of providing intelligence for the, the Union Army. Now, mm-hmm. by all accounts, he wasn't that successful at this. It looks like he regularly and repeatedly overestimated uh, Confederate troop strength. And as a result, McClellan was uh, very overly cautious in his strategies. Uh, although he did run a, a quite successful counterintelligence operation in, in Washington's high society. But then after the war, he went straight back to private sector clients, um, you know, hunting down outlaws. And it, probably the most famous case and probably his most famous failure is the um, the chase for Jesse James. And this was a, a, an, ex- an example of a case that really tarnished his reputation. There were a number of... Um, let's call them civilians injured in this in in the kind of final standoff with Jesse James. And this seems to be where he's really been pushed over the line and he goes all in with this kind of labor activism type work. And he moves from just previously infiltrating labor activist groups to find out who the ringleaders are um, and to put it bluntly, get them fired. He then starts getting into strike breaking and hiring what is essentially a private police force to come in and, and crack some skulls and get workers back to work when they're uh, they're on strike. And all of this culminated in the Battle for Homestead in Pennsylvania, where um, his, his troops, which they essentially were, tried to land by barge in the town of Homestead, um, only to be seen off by a pretty sub- significant force of townspeople who uh, armed themselves with ceremonial cannons from the town hall um, to fire on his barges. This ended up with uh, several hundred Pinkerton troops surrendering and, and being kind of railroaded out of town. Um, so quite a, a high profile failure for the company. And this generated some of those first very high profile discussions about should they really be doing this? And there were some earlier examples of um, some testimonies in court. And there's one one uh, phrase that always stuck out with me, one, one kind of testimony someone gave where they said, you know, it wasn't me that I think they were accused of throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police officer. And they said, it, it wasn't me that did this. But really think about it, a Pinkerton would have as much impetus as anyone to say I did because it shows their services are needed. So they can't come back to you and say, we found nothing. They have to show you that there's a threat there. So (laughs) that's part of the real danger that people started to highlight with this kind of privatized investigatory work. And then eventually, I think the government started to become aware of this. And, you know, this is a process that took decades, but eventually it culminated in the Anti-Pinkerton Act, which, as we know, uh, forbade the federal government from hiring and interacting with the Pinkertons. This didn't entirely stop them. The Pinkertons uh, had a bit of a comeback in World War One in kind of European intelligence working for the government purely because of personnel shortages. And the company does still exist today where it works for the private sector. So this is a, right. a very interesting history that, that's changed a lot over time. I think the modern day Pinkerton has, it, it appears to have cleaned up its act quite greatly, but um, still a very controversial company with a, a really interesting uh, collection of stories, not just the ones Pinkerton wrote himself. It, it does raise some interesting questions, Lewis, because through all this conversation, I keep going back to the frame of mind of these companies doing intelligence functions, but still you know, selling their services to the government or acting on behalf of the government but you've brought up some cases here with the Pinkertons in particular where, you know, no, it's it's working with companies to provide muscle, let's say, um, uh, almost a paramilitary function for them. Uh, and that gets to the the issue of, of, of disaggregating out their, their, their government services from their other services. And that's hard because they're very similar services for a period of time. You're doing private detective work, and they weren't the only ones, there are other private detectives in in history, they are essentially doing intelligence collection uh, on behalf of clients who hire them for a particular purpose. And depending on the agency, maybe they're doing more analysis or less analysis, but at a minimum, they are doing some form of clandestine collection of information that we would recognize as intelligence. And some of that is wholly private, certainly by the 19th century. What I don't have a good sense of is before that, you know, did, did something like private detectives who were clandestinely collecting information in a profit making sense, were they operating in the UK or in, in the colonies? back to the 17th and 18th centuries? 
That's a good question. And one I'm not really aware of. Pinkerton are probably the first company that that really generated the most attention, at least enough attention for me to be able to find those little clues uh, where yeah. scandals and things like that have put them on the history books. Yeah. Um, they certainly weren't the last after Pinkerton. There were uh, hundreds of these companies appearing across the US and elsewhere because mm-hmm. people saw how successful Pinkerton were. They saw the the publicity the company was garnering. And, and mm-hmm. as a result, this became pretty big business. But I can't think of any examples before them. Right. So we've got different categories which overlap now. We've got private companies that are essentially arms of the state or almost impossible to to disentangle from the state. And maybe this is some Venetian merchants who are also rulers uh, of, of the enterprise. You've got companies that are private but are working for the government or closely entwined with government operations. Maybe that's the East India Company, the Pinkertons in some ways. You don't yet have companies, um, and, and of course, as we just mentioned, there are companies that are collecting intelligence in almost a detective fashion for particular clients. But we haven't yet mentioned large companies that are operating, whether it's retail, technology, oil and gas, finance, entertainment, you name it. Large companies whose primary business is something else. Widget making, service providing, they're making money. And then they decide that they need an intelligence function. So almost like a nation state has the goal of protecting its people, providing for the common welfare, however you define the purpose of a collective political entity, and then deciding they need intelligence to support that mission. Similarly, you have private sector companies that eventually decide in order to keep making widgets, in order to keep providing technology services or consulting, we need an intelligence function to do at least analysis, but possibly also some sort of collection and perhaps also some covert action. When did that develop? What are the companies that you've found that first started to develop some kind of, at a minimum, threat analysis and perhaps wider intelligence functions within the scope of a larger multinational corporation or company within a country, primarily for use for its own decision makers? That's a really interesting question. I think in some ways that that resembles the modern private sector of intelligence, because you do have companies that are still selling intelligence, Pinkerton among them, but there's others, Control Risk, Sibyline. And then you've got companies that have in-house personnel who do this work while being a a badged employee of the company. And this seems to, from what I can see, have come along a lot later. Now, I say seems because this is so much harder to see. It's much easier to see the vendors because they're right. they're advertising they they're talking very loudly about what they do whereas the in-house people tend not to be and like you said these companies have no legal or regulatory mechanism by which they must provide this information from their own records as government agencies often do and also no motivation because why would you this work is something right. that's often a little bit controversial people are often a bit nervous about the idea of intelligence when anyone's doing it let alone a private company so why would they share it if they didn't have to i think the the first example that i found that that you could call a truly in-house department uh, was henry ford at uh, the ford motor company so in 1916 he hired a a navy veteran a guy called harry herbert bennett uh, in what was really a kind of chief security officer type role. Now, Bennett set up what's called the Ford Service Department, so a very vague, generic sounding department. And his first role was really about wartime counterintelligence and anti-sabotage. So they hired this Navy guy because they were working a lot with US Navy intelligence at their Highland Park facility. But then after the war in particular, towards the end of the war and after the war, this started changing into a kind of union busting type role. And it really looks very similar at that point to the Pinkertons. And this is something that we saw a lot of throughout the the kind of um, US industry, the, the kind of um, car industry in particular. But we also start seeing these kind of strange, I don't know what you'd call them, kind of private unions emerging 
that were looking to protect industrialists against sabotage, labor activism, and things like that. So in the US, in the Midwest in particular, we saw the American Protective League emerge in about 1917. By 1918, they had about 350,000 members, so an absolutely enormous organization that worked very closely with the FBI and local law enforcement agencies. And their job was really to protect private business from... Uh, spies, anti-war activists, labor radicals, saboteurs, and people like that. Now, these are really interesting. Amy Ziegart, in in her new book, In Spies, Lies, and Algorithms, she talks a little bit about the the, uh, American Protective League and says that, you know, despite immense civil liberties breaches, they never actually caught a single spy. Uh, They were really just a kind of feel-good operation, but more than anything, they were about union busting, and often that's what it comes back to. And across the Atlantic in the UK, um, similar activities came around towards the end of, of the First World War with the founding of the Economic League. Now, at the time, it was called uh, it was called National Propaganda. That was late, later uh, renamed. And this was formed by uh, a chap called Blinker Hall, who was a Royal Navy Admiral. And he was the former head of the Admiralty's Room 40, the cryptanalysis section. And this, this organization, they start out with a absolutely enormous amount of seed money, about a quarter of a million pounds back in, back then, which is an enormous amount of money from wealthy business owners uh, to set up this kind of labor surveillance movement that would keep an eye on exactly the same thing, you know, uh, foreign spies, saboteurs, uh, anti-war activists, and most importantly of all, kind of labor radicals, labor activists. And they appear to have cooperated quite closely with the government. There's a lot of hints at some sort of chatter between the two around who they ought to be keeping a close a close eye on um now this this group they use a lot of their lessons around kind of the value of propaganda and the value of surveillance methodology from during the war and they kind of did two things on one hand they went out and evangelized the values of of kind of industrialism and capitalism uh, and the dangers of of you know communism and and labor activism and then on the other hand they maintained extensive blacklists of workers if you'd complained about uh, safety concerns at your pu- at your plant if you had mm-hmm. um you know tried to unionize anything that put you on their radar whether it's genuine or or Potentially something that, that today we would consider a kind of protected uh, category of, of activity at work, you would end up on one of these blacklists and find yourself uh, excluded from industrial employment across the country. Um, now, this organization and a, a number of others very similar, there were groups with names like the Industrial Intelligence Bureau, the British Empire Union, um, that, that worked to kind of keep an eye on all these sorts of groups. They seem to have benefited a lot from support from the British government after the Invergordon mutiny, where a number of sailors in, at a base in Scotland mutinied over, over pay. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, the Admiralty was very concerned that, that these kind of mutineers, once they were kicked out of the Navy, would, would go work in the uh, Royal Fleet Auxiliary or in the Merchants Navy. So they reached out to these organisations, helped blacklist them from working on the docks, working in the Merchant Navy and things like that. So quite a an extensive operation and something that continued for for decades and decades, I believe off the top of my head, I think it was about 1992 when the Economic League was exposed on a, a kind of British investigations TV show wow. uh, that, that unmasked this, this blacklisting that was going on. It was thought at this time that this kind of put the matter to bed. And then in 2012, the London Crossrail Project, which is a, one of the, the kind of major um, transport projects going on in London, um, there was a, a lawsuit that, that unmasked the fact that a, a similar organization that was kind of the spiritual success of the Economic League was still doing this. It was still blacklisting workers who had raised mm-hmm. concerns. So this is, although it's a very kind of old school way of doing business, this is something that really hasn't gone away that much. It still rears its head even in the, the modern era. And as, as an issue, I'm sure that we will talk about for, for many more modern companies, uh, there is that range there, isn't there? So you've got on the one hand, you could easily see when this is starting 100, 130 years ago, this is the anarchist era. This is the 1890s and after the turn of the century when you've got not just political leaders, but private companies being attacked by no kidding terrorists uh, driven by anarchist motives. And it makes sense for a company like the Ford company you started with to say we we need to know individuals who are associated with that cause so that they do not sabotage our facilities. But it's very easy to see the slippery slope there. 
is you go from known anarchists who have committed sabotage in the past and put them on a list, and then it's suspected <laughs> uh, near near do wells. Then it's people who hold views that are, are not fully supportive of our corporate intent. And then it gets into quasi political activity and worker harassment quite easily. That's that's an ethical dilemma that probably continues to the modern day, but you can fully understand its origins there right around the, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. You've summed it up very neatly there. And I think that the ethical dilemma still exists today. It was a question I asked uh, of my interview participants when I was doing my field work. Um, and these were all modern practitioners in the private sector and intelligence space. These were people working for uh, about 50 of the world's biggest corporations in their intelligence teams. And I asked the question, you know, what are the ethical constraints that shape or influence your work? And the pictures people gave me, the answers were really, really interesting because what I found was most practitioners have very little concern around doing, you know, open source intelligence work around environmental threats. You know, if you're operating, if you're an oil company operating in the Middle East, mm -hmm. you're worried about the Islamic State attacking your facilities. That's sure. a very genuine worry. Very few people have any kind of ethical concerns about doing intelligence to, to kind of add protective uh, protectiveness mm -hmm. to your industry uh, to your to your business for that kind of thing then you've got the kind of uh, the more questionable and the more difficult work and that's where the ethics got really interesting because people you could really see people struggling to determine where the ethical line is you look at things like mm -hmm. um, environmental activism and the environmental activist movement has a long history of being infiltrated by corporate activists um, you know of, of various companies um, uh, sorry, not corporate activists, corporate intelligence operators, um, long history of energy companies hiring uh, intelligence subcontractors to place human agents, uh, human sources inside these activist movements. But on the other hand, there is also a real danger. If you've got any large crowd of people coming to your office to protest, you probably want to know about it so you can at least close the doors and send people home early to keep them safe. On the other hand, if you're infiltrating these organizations to find out who the leaders are, to find out what they're up to, to try and discredit them, to try and undermine them, that becomes much more subversive, that becomes much more dangerous and right. a lot less ethically defensible. And like you say, it's a slippery slope. A lot of companies start along this path with good intentions. They say, I just want to keep my colleagues safe. I want to keep our company safe. And then that definition of safe starts to creep over time and it becomes, well, you know, we need to know where the, you know, yes, we need to know where the terrorists are. So we'll focus on that. Well, now we need to know where the environmental activists are. Mm -hmm. Now we need to know who the environmental activists are and why they're targeting us. And, oh, we might start thinking about who the critics of the company are. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts to get really problematic. There's probably one of the most well-known cases in the private sector of kind of an ethical misstep is a... Uh, quite well-known uh, website provider. Um, I won't go into details of naming names here, but this is um, a, a well-known e-commerce company that's um, been around for a number of years. And their intelligence team uh, appears to have really lost sight of what it's about. And they, uh, they were called out in the media a few years ago, and a number of employees were charged federally in the U.S., with some pretty aggressive harassment of critics of the company. Now, these were not activists threatening to storm the corporate headquarters and burn the place down or to kidnap executives. This was, from what it looks like, a, a an old couple from somewhere in rural America who were just writing a blog about how annoying this company was and how they weren't giving equal protection to people using the platform to sell as those using the platform to buy. And an executive seems to have taken a a uh, real offense at this this criticism and i believe the the kind of terminology used was you know i want this couple gone i want this website gone so the intelligence team was set on on this mission and this is where they seem to have really kind of lost the plot is the only way i could describe it mm -hmm. um going from intelligence collection straight into the kind of covert action world putting bugs on this couple's car, um, surveilling them, hiding out outside their house, keeping an eye on what they're up to. And these were all and things that, that came out in court, correct? That's right, yeah. And eventually, um, as I understand it, sending you know a, a pig's head to the couple, sending a box of live cockroaches and things like that to try and intimidate them, um, you know, really 
going off the off the edge of what could even be remotely considered good ethics or even intelligence collection or intelligence mm-hmm. activities into covert action. So mm-hmm. very, very dangerous case there. And I think one thing that really stood out for me in that case was one of the analysts involved, it was uh, her first job and her first, her first private sector intelligence job straight out of college. And to her, she just thought that's what intelligence was. And there's a really some quite jarring interviews online. Um, if you Google the cockroach cults, there's some, some interesting articles that talk about this particular case. And uh, this, this young analyst kind of said, well, I had no one to turn to to ask. I just assumed this, what the, this was what the job was. And, and that's a real problem in the sector is that there's no ethical code of conduct. There's, no, there's very little in the way of law in the British government. You have the Regulatory of Investiga- Investigatory sorry, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act of 2000, which says what you can and can't do if you're an intelligence or an investigations practitioner. In the private sector, you just have good old-fashioned civilian law and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that particular case, it was the individuals that went to jail or that were charged. The company is doing just fine. It took a reputational hit, but mm. um, you know it was the individuals that, that were found to have crossed the line. And that's part of the problem. There, there is no guidebook on how to do this. And while there are industry uh, kind of governing bodies, there's the Association of International Risk Intelligence Professionals that does have an ethical code of conduct. In my interviews, I found that only 3.5% of practitioners would cite uh, industry standards as having anything to do with the ethics of their job. What I found the most common answer was were my personal ethics. I believe in being a good person, yep. or my religious values say this, so I I will follow that that kind of value. The next most common was the corporate standards for intelli- uh, for ethics. Hmm. But what I found was that very few corporations explicitly had ethical guidelines for doing intelligence. The right. corporate guidelines were conduct yourself appropriately be a good person, don't be evil <laughs> to cite one, one tech company. That leaves a lot wide open. A lot wide open. It, it leaves a lot for individuals to interpret what does behave appropriately actually mean. And there's very little in the way of, of guardrails around that. So you can easily see how these cases come around, especially when there's no real private sector intelligence school. There are increasingly courses teaching this with a goal to get people into the private sector, mm-hmm. but there's no there's no book on how to do this. Whereas if you're going into the government, you'll get a, a uniform intelligence training, depending on the agency you join. Now that might differ by agency, but at least, you know, all the people working with you have a same, right. they have a same ethical conception of what the job is. And they also have the same toolkit and training around them in the private sector. It really depends on where your colleagues have been hired from. If they've been hired after the CIA, if they've been hired straight out of college, they're going to have very different views right. of what intelligence is or isn't and sure. what the ethics around that should and shouldn't be. So it's really down to the individuals. And that leaves a lot of room for, for flexibility and creativity, which is absolutely a good thing, but also room for misstep when it goes wrong. Even back Uh, I'll say historically, but we're not talking deep history now, but even back into the 20th century, part of those, those ethics, of course, reflect societal norms. And where I think some of the things you just described would be seen as completely out of bounds by the vast majority of the population, they would say that private sector companies should not be sending, you know, severed animal heads or live cockroaches to, to people who speak out publicly against their, their company. I'm wondering if 100, 150 years ago, if that was the case, when when you actually had much more societal support for companies doing what they need to do to defend their to defend their people, yes, but also to defend their company and their reputation. So if, and I don't think you're you're saying that the Ford uh, organization did this, but if the Ford organization went to those lengths or something close to them against activists, maybe that would not have been seen as a as much of an ethical problem 100 plus years ago. That's a good point. And there was a lot of effort to shape that conversation as well. Um, you know, there was, a, and, and I think that's where Pinkerton's novels and comic books, they, they played a part in that, in, in supporting these activities and 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 shaping that, that kind of public discourse around these activities. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of that happening on a more kind of micro scale as well. Um, you know, I know I, I found some examples of, I believe it was the Pinkertons would send female agents door to door posing as makeup sellers during labor activity, during periods of labor activity to speak to the wives of the striking workers. 
and they would kind of spin a story. And this was not about collection. This was purely influence ops at this point. They were sitting down and saying, oh, well, I, you know, I'm forced to sell makeup because my idiot husband joined a union and, and then he got fired because of that. So now, you know, we're destitute and I have to do this. So they're, wow. you know, really trying to shape that narrative on a, on a, a much more acute scale. Mm-hmm. You know, on the, on the kind of larger scale, a lot of the a lot of the press narratives around these court cases where someone had been tried on the back of a Pinkerton testimony, I think that's where a lot of those, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of those discussions came from. Mm-hmm. There would be pro Pinkerton articles talking about, well, you know, they're anarchists, of course, they're going to do this kind of thing. Th- thankfully, we've got the, you know, the brave and noble Pinkertons here to protect us. And then on the other side, you've got, um, you know, some pretty stark commentary about the dangers of this. And I mean, I think um, Jean-Christophe Agnew, he described it best where he said, you know, that if managers were the the kind of visible hand of the market, the Pinkertons are the visible fist, they're the shock troops of the industrial order. And, you know, I think you can't get a a more damning indictment of of how they could be seen than that. We've talked a lot so far, Lewis, about um, what, what I would call not just intelligence operations, right? You're not you're not just talking about core collection of intelligence. You're you're talking about a lot of action, right? A lot of whether it's paramilitary action or influence operations, things like that. But we haven't talked much about intelligence analysis, and I'm wondering if if your research has shown you when. I'm guessing in the last few hundred years, other than these episodic things about collecting the locations of, you know, French ships off the coast for the insurance purposes that are then of use to the Admiralty, but for these modern corporations that are collecting intelligence um, for their own decision makers, when did any kind of intelligence analytic function, people, people taking various bits of information, synthesizing them, trying to determine whether geopolitical trends or realistic threat assessments for the corporate suite. When did that develop? And do you think that's now common in some of these large companies? That's a great question. So I think I would probably say, and I say probably because like all these things, I can only get glimpses through the keyhole whenever there's been a scandal or a release or someone's been kind enough to to keep an archive somewhere waiting for me. Um, but I think it's probably after the Second World War. And I think a lot of that is those those practices bleeding mm. over from the public sector where people have brought back yeah. their wartime experience. Um, to answer your, your second question, I think this absolutely does go on today. I, I looked at how the private sector uh, applies the intelligence cycle, and I use that as a framework in my interviews to kind of talk through how various companies are doing intelligence, because to my earlier points, there's no two models. Everyone brings their own background and training mm-hmm. with them. So as a result, everyone does it differently. But analysis is really part and parcel of the of the work these days it's very much seen as a core part of it to those early examples one really stands out and it's it's probably my absolute favorite and you know i think if if anyone from netflix is listening and does want to make a tv show i think this this guy is really a candidate for it because he's just an absolutely fascinating individual mm. a chap called uh, julius lewis amos and he set up uh, after the second world war in, in 1946 the international services of information foundation now, a very difficult organization to research because if you search isi intelligence it takes you in a whole different direction uh, especially in this, the middle east yeah, this guy is very, very interesting, though. So he he's a former OSS uh, operative and um, former U.S. Air Force officer. And along with uh, his wife, who's former MI6 agent, Mary Veronica Grogan, they set up this organization to provide private intelligence. And if you if you look at their old copies of their digest, they used to they used to publish it literally says on the front, a private sector intelligence operation. Um, it's called the Inform Publication. And you paid $25 a year for access. And they would aim this at, at congressional um, audiences, military, government, but also corporate and private citizens. So some of the heavy industry companies in the US would pay uh, for memberships for up to 2,000 of their top executives to receive this publication. So quite quite successful, at least at times. 
um, as well as private citizens. And Amos, he was a real crusader against the the dangers of communism. You know, a lot of his writing was very much, you know, communism is the biggest threat to the free world, free world, and therefore you need to subscribe to this publication to stay informed about the things that are going on. And he claimed to have an extensive spy network across the Iron Curtain. And he would report on everything from political and military developments to scientific advancements, economic developments. Um, And he would at times approach the U.S. government and offer his services as a kind of ultra secret branch of, of the U.S. government. But most of the time, it was a bit more mundane than that. It was really taking these reports from his supposed network of collectors across across Europe and across Russia and then analyzing them and basically writing up these reports of what does this mean? What's actually happening here? Are these reports about the Soviets experimenting with cosmic rays? Are they something to take seriously? Or is this just nonsense that we can ignore? And when I was reading these reports, it really struck me how much they look like a a modern private sector intelligence vendors report. And I thought that was really fascinating. And I was able to look back at some of the kind of historical time periods he was reporting on. And with the benefit of hindsight, I was able to actually compare what he had reported on in his intelligence reports with the way history actually went. And most of the time, he was pretty accurate. He he got it pretty right, which is really interesting. Where this chap gets really interesting is that I don't actually know if this network of spies even existed or not, or if it was just a really clever marketing strategy to, (laughs) to get people in on this. And, you know, I think I'm probably as close to this guy as anyone given how much time I've spent digging through his papers and, and his archives. And, and I still couldn't tell you if he's just an outright fantasist or if he really was a, an incredibly uh, clever individual with this this amazing intelligence network. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in amongst his papers, he has a number of financial statements. Now, I, I find this really interesting because in one of his diary entries, he says, you know, the most unreliable source of intelligence is the paid informer. And then literally in the very next folder, it's it's records of how he pays his informers. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, this is things like uh, pretty substantial sums, $24,000 annually to a, an Orthodox priest in Istanbul who was supposedly able to leverage a network of priests across the Iron Curtain. Um, there was a, a Polish counterintelligence and cryptography officer based in Paris who worked with the French Surety. Uh, there's a U.S. Army intelligence officer who's uh, OSS's guy in Rome, who's also the uh, ISI's contact with the Vatican's intelligence system. Um, and he's paid $18,000 annually for doing this. I looked at this and his annual costs ran to about $120,000, which today would be about $1.15 million. Um, So pretty substantial amounts of money. Now, part of me suspects this was part of this marketing ploy because a lot of his letters to would-be subscribers and would-be organizations were kind of saying, this is expensive work Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I need to do it to, to help fight off the red menace, but I need your support. I need you to help me fund this. And it looks like a lot of these financial statements were included as evidence of this. So it's really hard to tell if this was just a a marketing ploy or not. But then there are letters from some of these people that are buried away in different parts years later. So if it is a if it is a, a hoax, it's a very, very elaborate one. And. Honestly, like I say, I'm I'm just really unsure if this guy was an outright fantasist or a, a very genuine vendor of intelligence. And I think the important thing with him is it doesn't actually matter because people believed it was genuine. They paid for it. And the modern intelligence sector in some ways can look like that. Some of the mm-hmm. I mean, most of the very credible vendors, they will show you their analysis. They'll show you their working and you can understand how they got to that analysis. But some of the more questionable ones you know, it's it's a mystery box and, and you've got no idea how they're doing this kind of stuff. And, and it would not be at all unthinkable for someone to be out there selling intelligence based off of complete paper mill level reporting. That is a fascinating story. And it points to the one of the key issues between the government and the private sector when it comes to intelligence collection. So a, a government, let's say the United States or the UK, can spot and uh, assess and develop and recruit sources to provide information. And while there is risk involved, they, they have some assurance that this big, powerful government will do what it can in various means to protect that source, whether it's compartmentalizing the information, whether it's 
uh, helping them with tradecraft and security in collection, and at the extreme, in some environments, to exfiltrate the source and perhaps the source's family in the case of dire circumstances. Private sector, maybe some companies have done that for their confidential sources of information, but it certainly would seem reasonable that someone who had information of use to a private sector company would not feel as confident giving that information to uh, intelligence collectors of a private sector company because those assurances just can't be at the same level as those of a major government service. Does that sound right? Uh, I think it does. It depends on the case. Um, in Amos's case with the ISI Foundation, I mean, he was such a dramatic individual. It, it leads me to question a lot of these claims. He actually says in one of his letters uh, asking for financial support, uh, ISI's courier system operates at great personal hazard to its members, eight having suffered violent death in the past year. So he, he's, you know, he's embracing this danger. Um wow. You know, and I think you know the CIA took a look at this guy. They they assessed his kind of reliability, and they concluded he's just a complete fantasist. He he claimed that he had induced a, a Soviet MiG to defect across the Iron Curtain. Now, what had actually happened was a, a MiG from Poland had uh, flown to to Denmark and and uh, defected. Amos had approached the CIA uh, several months beforehand and said that through his network of priests, he was able to induce a. Um, a Bulgarian MiG to defect across. Um, now it, it appears that just something similar happened and he tried to claim credit for it. <laughs> he also claimed credit for a lot of things. He claims to have had, um, you know, medals and decorations from pretty much every nation on the planet and, you know, a lot of big claims, which is why I'm very suspicious of this mm -hmm. chap. But your point about the idea of the, the kind of protection of sources, I think for this guy, he really spun it as a sales point. Look how dramatic and exciting this stuff is. It's, it's just like James Bond. You know, it's it's something people want to spend money for. So, you know, I think in his case, it's probably quite questionable. I think in the, the kind of modern sector and the more, let's call it the more mature sector, because I think there is a degree of immaturity when when looking into how this guy operated, it really depends. You know, there are organizations out there that have SCIFs that, that do receive classified government intelligence. Um, you know, they are tr seen as trusted. They hold um, clearances and therefore they're able to, to receive this stuff. That's quite unusual. The wider sector is generally not clear. Um, it's a cooperative industry. It's something that I've always found very fascinating is, you know, I, I work for a tech company. I can pick up the phone to the intelligence team of our biggest rivals who I'm broadly on first name terms with and talk to them about what they're concerned about. Are they concerned about threats to data centers? Are they worried about this terrorist group? Are they worried about this activist group? And we could talk very openly without having to, you know, worry about sort of declassification risks and things that a government team might if they were sharing. So that's a fascinating think, insight right there, Lewis, because to the to the outsider, it would appear that one of the functions of an intelligence unit within a large company would be to protect secrets from its competitors and even to find means to collect information from those competitors. And instead, you're saying that at least on the protective side, that there, there's much more cooperation than one might suspect. Absolutely. I mean, protecting the company secrets does still exist. You know, I won't I won't phone up our competitors and say, hey, we're about to, you know, enter into this deal in this country. And, you know, this is highly sensitive stuff. You know, those things do kept kept very close to the chest. A lot of intelligence teams or wider security organizations will have uh, what we call insider risk departments, which are essentially the modern equivalent of, of a, a CI team that would look for you know, people exfiltrating the company's data, stealing intellectual property and things like that. But the teams that are focused on the security intelligence, because they're so much more focused on the external operating environment, there's a commonality. So in, in many ways, it looks more like the kind of government intelligence world during the, the global war on terror, where there was a lot more international cooperation because it's against a, a common set of threats. Now, that's not universal. There are some companies that are more reluctant to share than others. But by and large, most of the big kind of household names, 
they they sit on chat groups together and they share intelligence very free flowing. Um, they'll even share analysis with each other. In some cases, even finished product, uh, which I think is is a really insightful part of it. It's probably one of my favourite parts of working in this field. Is quite how collaborative it is. Whereas compared to government intelligence, is there's so many hoops to jump through if you ever want to share anything, even with your closest allies. So it's it's very different in that sense. In many ways, I think it's a competitive advantage, uh, or it's an industry wide advantage. Um, I found examples of, uh, to go back to the Arab Spring, um, the uh, ODNI reached out uh, to a group of private sector intelligence teams, mostly in the oil and gas industry, after the Arab Spring to find out how they were so ahead of it when most governments had gotten it pretty wrong. They'd really downplayed the risks. They they were very much caught off guard by it. Right. Whereas the private sector managed to evacuate most of its people. Most companies were pretty much on the front foot when it came to um, these kind of revolutions across the region. And the response that these companies gave was largely twofold. Partly was, well, we're using this new technology called social media because we don't have any other collection methods. So this is this is our main way of getting intelligence or at least getting that raw information. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it was cooperation, that these these teams would talk to each other and see, well, what are you seeing in your region? We're seeing this in our region. Well, hang on, that looks very similar. Maybe this is bigger than the government is saying it is. And that, that cooperation, that there's no bureaucracy for it to go through that would cause that intelligence decay before it could get between these these sort of partnering organizations so it's a much more efficient world in that sense you know your your discussion about all of these organizations and talking to each other makes me wonder so if we look at the largest of the large if you look at some of the largest revenue earning private organizations in the world so in retail we're talking i guess Walmart and Costco and Amazon and in pure tech, you're talking, of course, Apple and you're talking Samsung and Alphabet or Google and then oil and gas, BP, Shell, Exxon Mobil. Is it reasonable for people to to expect that these companies of these size, not necessarily any of those individually, but the companies within this category of the 50 largest companies, that they all have some sort of intelligence unit that is doing something beyond simply bodyguard protection of the CEO, but they're doing something like threat warning analysis and some geopolitical analysis and some form of intelligence collection to inform those efforts. Absolutely. I I would be very surprised to discover a large company these days that doesn't have some form of intelligence team. And to your point about, you know, is, is there someone doing this um, other than protecting the CEO? I think that really highlights that most companies actually have more than one intelligence team. You have the security intelligence team that's helping inform the, the corporate security team. You then often have a protective intelligence team that is informing the CEO's bodyguard team and, and informing their risks. Then you also have things like competitive intelligence, and that's where it gets a lot murkier. That's largely beyond the scope of my research, but I, I did have to look a little bit at competitive intelligence just to delineate it with security intelligence. And this is where companies are targeting one another. They're looking at what are our competitors doing, and they're collecting on them, and often through covert human sources, often through uh, open sources, but it's a, a whole mix of collection methodology taking place. And doing some pretty deep analysis on on what are our competitors up to now like i say that's a little bit beyond the scope of my research so it's not something i can talk to with much authority but again it tends to be pretty prevalent it's something that happens across most companies inside a risk teams which are kind of that corporate counterintelligence function they will often look to protect against that kind of work and to, to spot those kind of things uh, so there's there's this whole dance of different intelligence operations taking place within most companies and like i said i'd be shocked to find any of the big ones that didn't have at least some form of intelligence taking place mm -hmm. and of course uh, as you hinted earlier um, and, and told a story about some of these companies can take that and, and find that slippery slope takes them into uh, more aggressive operations. And we've already discussed that a bit, but I know there are some other cases in recent history, the last 20 years or so of cases gone wrong. And I don't want to leave you without talking about some of these. And I, I do have a distant recollection of one, and this goes back, it must be at least 15 years that there were some oil and gas companies that had hired uh, a firm with former intelligence people 
to infiltrate Greenpeace, I think it was. Are you familiar with that case? I am indeed. So that was the the intelligence company was called Hackloot, which is a London-based firm that used to be known as a retirement home for MI6 officers. And these days they describe themselves as absolutely not a retirement home for MI6 operators with a, a, a big wink. I think they really like to play off that, that kind of link. Um, and they had hired this this chap, uh, Manfred uh, Schrickenreiter, I think his name is pronounced, as a German individual to pose as a, a left-wing documentary filmmaker uh, in order to infiltrate Greenpeace. And this guy did so, and he got a lot of access. Uh, he'd previously done similar undercover work as a left-wing documentary filmmaker, so he played off those credentials. And eventually a... Uh, kind of counterintelligence operation by Greenpeace uh, looked into this guy. They they ran a pretty interesting investigation on him, and they started to notice a lot of odd things. You know, how is this hippie-ish left-wing filmmaker living such a luxurious life? He's driving a BMW. That seems really uncharacteristic. And eventually they broke into his apartment, and uh, I kid you not, they actually found an invoice that said, uh, you know, intelligence research on Greenpeace for hack loot. That's and, a clue. You know, yeah. That's, That's a, clue. a clue with a pretty significant amount of money. And then when this story broke, it, it got particularly interesting because it turned out he was also a, a an active German BND officer, a federal intelligence officer for the German government, oh. who was kind of doing this as a side gig. Um, so that caused a, a lot of embarrassment. Um, and th- this is why, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, the the environmental space has a long history of this kind of activity. They've got a... Um, probably one of the highest opsecs of any any sector of activism because of this. Um, this has happened time and time again. And I mean, I've heard credible rumors during my field work that there are vendors that today have uh, human sources inside groups like Extinction Rebellion. So this is this is something that hasn't fully gone away. It's something that I think is is one of the ethically shady sides of the industry. Mm-hmm. I think most people in the field are, are pretty uncomfortable with this kind of work. I think most most in the field stick to the kind of OSINT, the more ethically right. shiny side of things. But that's not to say this doesn't go on. And then and where it gets some, there is some gray area, right? Because twenty years ago, if you're if you're going back to that time frame, you didn't have some of the what should I say some of the opportunities that are fully present now. So private sector intelligence actors now can monitor activist groups remotely. You can infiltrate social media networks. You can misrepresent your intentions in a way that does not involve being a personally deceptive person face to face. It can be electronic deception. And I'm wondering if you can talk through the ethical issues there and in your research, what you found people working in this area where do they draw the line most often on what is acceptable and what isn't when it comes to electronic uh, monitoring and electronic activity? So this is a, a really important question. I think it's one that we still haven't answered. And what I've found is that largely people see a difference when you talk to practitioners and you say, okay, you know, what, what's ethical to you? What's unethical? They'll tell you, well, sending a, a, a human covert human source into Extinction Rebellion or Greenpeace, that's clearly wrong. You're misrepresenting yourself. You're forging relationships with people. You know, you're you're deceiving people and therefore that's not okay. But then the digital version of that, digital infiltration, joining a Facebook group or befriending someone on Facebook becomes much muddier. But ethically, there's not that much difference to it. Now, there's a few kind of different examples. I think on one end, you know, the very unethical end, you've got this human infiltration. On the far end, you've got kind of pure open source. You're reading things that people have published and therefore they want to be read. Therefore, how could that be wrong? And then in the middle, you've got kind of varying shades of this. So you've got what I refer to as avatar accounts. People make an account on social media and it's got a picture of a cartoon character and the name is, you know, Daffy Duck or it's just a string of numbers. And anyone seeing that, couldn't ever think that was a real person and a lot of practitioners will tell you that's okay you know you're not misrepresenting yourself you're just doing this to shield yourself you don't want to use your own personal social media media account because that might be risky um you're just doing it for protective measures that's probably okay others will tell you you know no that's still misrepresentation and then where it gets even murkier is sock puppet accounts and that's where i make an account maybe i use your picture david and i call myself you know david mcactivist and i go join an activist group pretending to be that someone is apparently who looks like sketchy you. if you're using my picture people <laughs> sure. people will be 
warned away immediately. But where it gets really creepy is AI generated imagery. And that seems to be quite common these days of uh, there's a website called This Person Does Not Exist um, that will just generate a random image of a, a fake person. And uh, they, they make this account that could be a real person. It seems real. They'll have fake friends. They'll have a you know, fake timeline that all looks real and stands up to scrutiny. And then they'll go and befriend people online and join these activist groups and start getting closer to the key members and start finding out more about them. And some practitioners will tell you that's fine. Others will tell you, no, not at all. And this is where it gets really difficult because there's very little ethically different between digital and in-person uh, misrepresentation like that and it can get quite dangerous in a lot of cases there are examples of um you know these covert operatives befriending people getting into pretty deep relationships with people buying pets with them and then just disappearing one night once their case is over and leaving a trail of destruction behind them so mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. a very very difficult one to to approve or disprove of and most practitioners i speak to will tell you they have no idea where the line is as someone who's, I mean, I've, I've got a whole paper on this topic. Um, I couldn't tell you where the line is because I think it's it's somewhere around probably the avatar accounts. I mm -hmm. think that's probably mm -hmm. okay. But even then, it really depends. And then it's very circumstantial. A lot of, a lot of practitioners will tell you, well, if I'm looking at a, a, a militant organization, an extreme right-wing group that's threatened to kill one of our employees, you know, that's, I, I have a lot more of a permissive environment ethically than if I'm looking at environmental activists that are entirely peaceful and how I can respond to that is, is going to be very different. So mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a moving target and it's one that I don't think we've quite figured out where it is. I can give you one example of probably a case that, that is almost certainly not ethical. And it's probably one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, it's from the mid two thousands um, where the accounting firm KPMG suffered an absolute major leak. And this was a, a British employee was was recruited by an investigations firm, and this firm approached approached the, this individual, who was at a conference in Bermuda, and this individual was involved in a commercial dispute, a, a kind of audit operation by KPMG between the owners of of the Russian firms Alpha Bank and Megafon. Mm -hmm. And it, it appears it was probably one of those two corporations that hired this this investigations company to, to kind of figure out what KPMG had found and to, to try and get kind of the inside track on it. And this this British, uh, the, the British operatives of this firm, they, they approached this individual working KPMG at, at this conference in Bermuda and said they were working for MI6. They were working for the British government and they needed to recruit him for a, a special mission. And they they sort of set out criteria for selecting this individual, and you know they they done some psychological profiling, and they said you know we need to find someone who works at KPMG who um, it was a man, a young man in particular who maybe fiddles his expenses, chases women, you know, but is a patriot, maybe likes the football, is a little bit risk taker, and this is the sort of person we think we could we could kind of dupe with this thing, and that's exactly what they did. They found an individual, and they launched this thing called Operation Yuka. And they set up this extensive dead drop system with this guy. You know, they had hollowed out rocks hidden around for wow. him to, you know, exfiltrate papers and leave them completely unnecessarily. But they had to give this guy the impression he was really working for MI6. Um, you know, they had signals he could leave that were to, to say when the dead drop had been filled and all sorts of things. And at the end of the the, the mission, they gave him a Rolex wristwatch that was engraved with. Uh, from a nation from a grateful nation oh. and this guy for a couple of years thought you know he, he was a national hero of some degree couldn't tell yeah. anyone about it until a number another employee it looks like from the investigations firm actually tipped off kpmg that this had happened and mm. blew the whistle on the whole thing and this story came down there's a, a great book called uh broker trader lawyer spy by Eamon javers uh, which tells this story and it's absolutely fascinating but that's an example that I think we can all agree is is dishonest. It's dece it's deceiving someone. It's um, hijacking their sense of national duty, um, and and that's something that I think most practitioners will tell you is probably not okay. But not all right. cases are as as clear as that. Well, look, we we can close the the ethics part of this by choosing to look at this as a good news story or a bad news story, and. The, the way I see it is it's it's a little of both. So on one side, this is a good news story because you've described an environment now where you have many, many large organizations 
operating in what we call the intelligence space, making these decisions. And it's largely dependent on individuals and perhaps managers, but but close to the individual level rather than the executive decision-making level um, as to what means they use. And generally things, there haven't been that many crises compared to the large number of cases that must be going on. So the good news is, maybe we're just not hearing about it, but the good news is a lot of individuals appear to be making ethical decisions in in what um, methods to use to gather information here. Of course, the bad news is, as you've described, the private sector is, is not bound by law and regulation to the same extent as the governmental intelligence agencies, which shocks people a bit. Everybody's afraid of big, bad government, but they're they're not so afraid of the big box retailer down the, down the street. But it's almost like a pre-legislation environment now for all of these, these companies bound by, what, self-regulation, by people putting constraints on their own behavior up to, of course, the law. There are some things that you can't do by law to other human beings. But in terms of the actual practice of intelligence, you've portrayed a situation where it's not quite the Wild West but there's still a lot of room for individual companies to do good or or do bad as long as it's not purely illegal. That's exactly how I would describe it. And I think, you know, thankfully, the vast majority of practitioners I interviewed, 99% of them were very clear, you know, I, I will not engage in work that I think is unethical. Um, when I asked people why they do this job, the overwhelming response I got was to keep people safe. Uh, you know, very few people say to make money and, and ruin lives, you know, yeah. Yeah. everyone's response was some degree of to keep people safe, to keep my colleagues safe. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of the next tier down of answers were to keep business moving, to keep, you know, keep the company operational and things like yeah. that. So I think that's at least how practitioners see themselves. Having worked, you know, over a decade in this field, I, I would largely agree with that. I think that's how I see most of my colleagues in the industry. And these are people, like I say, that I talk to regularly because it's very cooperative, it's very collaborationary, and it's, it's a very friendly space. So I, I am always shocked when I hear these these more scandalous stories. Now, the other thing I will highlight is that my research skews towards the scandals because, to mm -hmm. my earlier point, there's no declassification date in private sector intelligence. So the only time you ever find out about it is when there is a scandal. So as a result, the history of this field looks very shady and it, it paints a disproportionately shady picture than, than what I think is really going on. I think to the the point on deregulation, this is or unregul lack of regulation. This is an area that it worries me greatly because there's no know your customer requirements in this space. And I, I wouldn't be surprised at some point to find out that a, an intelligence vendor had been engaged by a terrorist organization or by a, a cartel or mm -hmm. someone like that, mm -hmm. because there's very little in the way of controls around that kind of stuff. And right. for the most part, it's relatively harmless risk reporting. At the higher end, it's very sophisticated geopolitical intelligence. And at the extreme end, there's some pretty sophisticated collection methods and tools mm -hmm. and technologies out there. Mm -hmm. So that lack of that lack of legislation and regulation is is very nerve wracking, I put it. Absolutely. Well, we don't leave a conversation in chatter without reaching into our so-called chatter box to ask you one of a set of pre-printed questions. Let's see what it has to offer today. Lewis, who played the best James Bond? Ooh, very tough question. And you realize you, you will get hate mail no matter what your answer is because the ones you don't choose have some very avid fan bases. Absolutely. I, I'm probably a Daniel Craig fan more than anything. I think he's closest to the the book James Bond. I think he, he mm -hmm. adds a bit of gritty realism to it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd probably go with Daniel Craig. And and what are you thinking about the next Bond? Because that there is a, a large debate going on in the fan community about the gritty realism being true to the Bond of the novels, at least to some extent, versus being a more modern, inclusive franchise, um, which actually moves you away from James Bond, who is not an entirely pleasant character along some modern movements such as Me Too. So where do you see James Bond going and what would you actually like to see? 
I think, I mean, if I if, if I had to see anything, I mean, I think as a bald guy, I'd love to see the first bald Bond and I'm wrapping up my PhD soon. So if any of the studios are in the in, in the market for a bald Bond, I'm available. But I think, you know, I think that that degree of, of inclusiveness is important. I think intelligence is a field that has long been seen as only open to a, a very certain demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think part of that, to, to come back to your very earlier points, um, when we first started talking about representation on on film and in popular culture i think that that only amplifies that and you know analysis needs diversity of thoughts and you know we're going to struggle if we're a, a homogenous sector so i think we absolutely need more people on film and screen that that young people can look at and say hey i could do this job and even if it's not always the most accurate representation of it it makes the field look very cool and it's a, it's a great recruiting tool and it gets people interested in this world and i think that's a, a really powerful thing well said Lewis, thanks for joining me today. Thanks very much for having me, David. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.